awareness is the greatest thing you can teach and the greatest thing you can learn. I don't need to teach you how to be a special forces guy. I don't need to do, if you're just aware and you kind of have an idea of where bad things can happen and you're aware, you are most likely going to make it out okay. My guest today is Jonathan Gilliam. Jonathan is a former U.S. Navy SEAL and FBI Special Agent. Jonathan is the real deal. After 9-11, he served in an undercover role as a federal air marshal flying on U.S. transcontinental flights. When it comes to personal safety, there are very few as qualified as he. Jonathan's latest book, Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness and Attack Survival, is the definitive safety bible. Weekly, there are major threats, mass killings, terrorist attacks that are specifically targeting everyday civilians. No one really expects violent situations to occur, but they do, and usually without advance warning or your control. Jonathan shares his experience and expertise on how to not end up a victim of a violent crime or attack. I recently sat down with Jonathan to talk about what motivated him to write Sheep No More and how we should all be more prepared to safeguard our families and our home. Jonathan, thank you so much for being on my podcast. Since we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, I've been looking forward to it. We, we started speaking. I told you to hold up all the stories because we got to save them for the podcast. And once again, thanks so much for being here today. You got it. Listen, I, I think this is something that... We'll, people need to start doing more with their podcasts is not just having celebrities on, but having other podcasters that really are doing their part in, um, in helping inform beyond uh, the scope of mainstream media. So I think this is very important, these conversations that we have. Yeah, I totally agree. And that's why I reached out to you. So before we begin with your book, which is Sheep No More, I'll spill the beans on that just a few more minutes because I want to get a background because uh, you're a thoroughly impressive guy, badass guy. In a good way. Former U.S. Navy SEAL, FBI Special Agent, a Federal Air Marshal, and a whole bunch of other things since. So before we begin, how do you grow up and you say, I want to be a Navy SEAL? How does that work? Well, it didn't used to be that way because nobody knew who they were. You know, um, we heard stories about special forces or commandos. That was the thing when I was younger, you know, commandos or the Green Berets. And I didn't know really anything about SEALs until I met a guy who I just found out who he was. I forget his name right now, but I, he's actually passed away. But I met him in San Diego uh, around 1990, I believe it was, when I was going to college out there. And um, gosh, this guy was just amazing. He was Hawaiian. He was like, you know, six foot three. Um, everything that you would think a SEAL looks like, typically not what SEALs look like. You know, a lot of times they're scrappy. and um, But nobody knew what it was. And so when I, after I met with him, uh, he was dating somebody in the gym where I worked and we had this conversation cause I was thinking about trying to be a pilot, you know, and I was also majoring in religions and philosophy at that point in time in college. And we started talking about the spiritual side of being a seal. I mean, I know it sounds weird to most people, but the reality is when you, when you look inside your soul at that level, it's a very terrifying and spiritual thing. And so we had this incredible conversation. He told me I should go down there and check out the obstacle course and see what it's all about. And, and I'm telling you, it was as if God, no, it wasn't as if God, you know, has always worked this way in my life. He just said, this is what you're going to do. And I, I just happened to be studying at that point in time, the story uh, about Job uh, in the old Testament or the Torah. And um, this, you know, Job had everything taken from him. He didn't really uh, have a choice in the matter and, and he didn't lose his faith. And so I figured, you know what, uh, the only thing harder than having everything, uh, than having nothing is having everything taken away from you. And so I chose, uh, cause I didn't think God was going to make me go through seal training. I chose to give it all up. And uh, not that I had a lot, but what freedoms you have and the dignity you have and the whatever you think you're capable of doing when you go to Bud's, it's a totally different story. I mean, they take it all away from you. So uh, I gave all that up so, so I could go on this quest. And then um, it was a pretty interesting uh, journey. So you, you weren't in the military, you weren't in the U.S. Navy when you went down to the obstacle course. You just saw that obstacle course in San Diego and said, I want to be a Navy SEAL. 
Yeah, because I saw what they were doing and I saw the training that they were going through. And I and after having this conversation with this guy um, who was very inspirational and, and I got to tell you, we just had this conversation at the front desk at the gym. I mean, we were it wasn't, it wasn't like we had dinner in this uh, huge uh, lecture. It was like, wait, wait, wait we sat John, down John, had, one second. How old were you? How old were you at that you point in time? I was about I'm, I'm 51 now, so this was I was about 20. I was about 20, 21 years old. So you're 20, 20, 20 20. You're 21 years old. You're working yeah. in a gym. It's not your own gym. You're working, handing out right. towels, do whatever you got to do in the gym. I don't know. I'm just making that up. Uh, all right. So you're working in this gym. You have this conversation with this guy who is badass as can be, Navy SEAL. He takes you down, looks at obstacle course. Most people would say, you got to be insane. I will never put my body through that. You look yeah. at this and you have the wherewithal as a 21-year-old to say, this is what I want to do. Yeah. I mean, I've always tried to follow the will of God in my life. And, uh, and I, I just, I, there's something weird about this. It was a calling and, and I knew everything came together at the right time, studying the things that I was studying, um, learning and more and more about God's will and uh, what this nation is all about. You know, the, what the founding fathers did and the story of Job, it just, it just profoundly hit me to the point where I said, I am being called to give it all up and to suffer and to choose to suffer. And, so, it, and it, everything aligned and it did, it wasn't easy. It's not like I chose to do it and they just gave me the opportunity. Uh, I had to finish college. So I had to move back home. I left California, moved back home to Arkansas so I could focus on school at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. And then when I graduated, it, it, I was already in good shape, but it took another two and a half years um, of training so overall, I'd say about five years of physical training to get to the point where I was in an Olympic caliber <clears throat> athlete or college caliber athlete and uh, or professional sports caliber athlete, because those are the people who are going to buds a lot of the times. And so it took about five years to get to that point. Uh, two and a half years after I graduated, it took almost three years to get a SEAL slot. And because I could have gone enlisted right away, but yeah, I read too many books and thought that being an officer was the way to go. So I had to struggle to get a slot and that's a whole story in of itself. But overall, the year I got it, only 15 people were chosen uh, for officer candidate school for a SEAL slot. So uh, that's when I got it. Unlike Job, Job didn't choose his lot. You chose your lot. Right. That's a big right. difference, man. Uh, he had it all taken away and he had no idea why, but he still had inner strength. You looked at this and said, I'm doing this. So uh, uh, yeah, here's the thing we did have in common, though. We both had uh, a life and, and that life was taken away from us. So whether I gave it away or taken away uh, it, listen, I grew up with nothing. I grew up poor, but even poor people have freedom and aren't suffering physically in the way that we suffer in bud. So when you gave up comfort, that's the biggest thing is giving up comfort, which Job had taken from him. You know, when I gave up that comfort, it was, um, it was a, the entire time I was in Buzz was really a struggle with myself more than anything. Yeah, you know, we had, um, I had on the show Darren McBrunet, Navy SEAL, 24 years instructor, top guy. Mm -hmm. And he said, I said, as an instructor, what are you trying to do? Like, what's your goal? He goes, well, basically, it's pretty simple. We're trying to tear a person apart and just recreate them and tell them you can do this. Yeah. Really, it's easy because he goes, we get the guys who could swim fast. We get the guys who could run fast. It's not about running. It's not about swimming. It's not about physical fitness. It's about what's between your two ears. Yeah, because, you know, everybody, I, I, there's a lot of people who show up at Buds. I mean, we started with over 130 people, uh, 11 graduated with the original class, and then another 10 got recycled. So overall, 21 people graduated. And of those, you know, those individuals that showed up there, you could have, and that succeeded, you could have talked to any of them. They said, mm -hmm. I'm not going to quit. And that was their main thing was that they knew when they got there that they were not going to quit. They had a need not to quit. Other people had a, a need to serve their country. They had a need, which we have that as well, but we mm -hmm. had a need not to quit. And so the, the quest throughout uh, became, which is interesting because this has become a, uh, my definition of the meaning of life is that, you know, we were there to be, to show that we could be trained, trusted, and, and that we wouldn't quit. And, uh, once, once you get through and you prove that you can be trained, they'll train you, you, you prove that you can be trusted because when you get out, you're going to be trusted with sensitive stuff. So they, they put a lot of trust in you, giving you explosives and things like that. 
and then uh, that you won't quit. They test you and life is pretty much the same way. So the, all the way through, I know people don't think of this stuff as spiritual, but all the way through, this was a, a, a spiritual quest for me. And uh, when I got out and I look at life the same way, it makes life a lot more understandable, the beginning and the end and what I have to do in between and uh, what may come next, because we didn't become SEALs until we graduate and go mm-hmm. through what's called SQT. It was STT then. And then we get in our platoon and start doing a workup. That's really where you start to right. become a SEAL. Right, right. So yeah. I, I look at life the same way. I'm, I'm going to finish <laughs> this life as nobody, but somebody who proved that I, that mm-hmm. I can be trusted, trained and won't quit. Uh, what happens after I, I leave this planet is um, that's where the real life starts, I believe. Yeah, you know, people don't get that. Buds is just the first step. You still have another, what, close to two years of training? Yeah, o- overall, when you complete it, it's about two years of training, you know, jump school. Uh, and then I, and they wanted me to go through some more junior officer training. So they sent me to ranger school. And so I graduated from ranger school in 99. Now went through BUDS in 97 and then graduated uh Ranger school in 99. So um, that was interesting. You know, it was you interesting. See, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Go. It was interesting. No, it, it was interesting because I, you know, was going through something that was tra- very traumatic for a lot of people. It was a, you know, Ranger school is not easy. You 62 days, you eat once a day and sleep an average of two hours a night for 62 days. So when you graduate, you have the immune system of a severe burn victim and you have about the same amount of vitamins in your system as somebody who's been dead for three days. So, I mean, that, and that's serious. They take you to the edge. Oh, how much weight, how much weight did you lose? About 22 pounds. And you weighed, you weighed how much going in? Well, I, I purposely ate a ton before uh. I went in <laughs> and if I could gain some weight. Cause I knew other guys show up, they're all ripped and they have a terrible time. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't, I don't remember how much I weighed when I went in there, but I know when I came out, I weighed less than I did when I graduated high school. So you're losing 10 to 15% of your body weight in a pretty short span of time and a lot of muscle because you're yeah. not eating. Wow. That must be so fatiguing. <laughs> But here's the interesting thing is that having gone through uh, BUDS and and learned uh, how to function with the chaos around you, I could sit there, even though it was totally chaotic and things were terrible, um, and I could function very well because I would just listen to the instructions that were given. I didn't care if they were beating me, push-ups, whatever. I only listened to the instruction. And whatever instruction they gave me, that's what I carried out. So the difference between BUDS and Ranger School was that BUDS was very emotional uh, and scary in a lot of ways. Ranger School for me was, um, I learned a tremendous amount because I went into it already pre-hardened from from BUDS. So I just simply concentrated on what they were trying to teach me. And I wasn't worried at all. I just was totally focused on what they I'll tell you one quick story if you want to hear this. I, so we had been out in the field for two weeks. We came back. We haven't had a shower or anything for two weeks. And so what you do is you, you only have really one set of clothes, maybe two sets of clothes. But I think at this point in time, we had one set. So you take your socks off every night um, and you lay them out so they can dry. Uh, you, um, for me, you know, I was a seal and there's a whole story to this, but uh, I, we, we would take our clothes off and lay them out so they would dry. Cause they're so, you're in Georgia. I mean, it, it is, putrid after two weeks of sweating and in these same clothes and laying in dirt and stuff. And so I laid my clothes out and, and most guys would do that. So they would dry and, and get some air fresh, uh, freshness about them. We only had at this point, cause we were in from the field. So that night we probably got about four hours of sleep. So we're all, they don't, we don't sleep in r- uh, racks. We just go out to the back on this gravel and they just say, go to sleep. So we go out there and we go to sleep. And uh, so as a SEAL, I know this is a lot of information here, but as a SEAL, they don't let us wear underwear because underwear has elastic in it, which is petroleum based. And if that comes in contact with oxygen, at least this is the excuse they give us, um, it's going to burn. And we breathe pure oxygen when we do uh, dives Wait, under the drain. On so the elastic in the underwear yeah. is petroleum this is based. The, this is the excuse they give us, right? I, I would think because... I would think it was a chafing or something. No, they take that. They See, I think that's the real reason they don't let us wear it because we're destroyed through chafing, not oh, wearing it. Right. So anyway, so we get to, so I get to ranger school and I don't, I'm not wearing underwear because we, you get used to not wearing it. Right. So I take all my clothes off. I have this whoopee 
which is like the, the, the heavy little blanket thing. And I'm wrapped up in that, but I'm totally naked. And so my clothes are over here. All the other guys got their skivvies and stuff on. And so I'm in dead sleep dreaming beautifully. And I hear somebody yelling in the distance. And so I kind of come out of my sleep and I look around and everybody is in the push-up position and the instructor is screaming at everybody because we're supposed to take uh, turns having watch throughout the night, you know, and there's a lot, there was a hundred people in my ranger class. And so every person does it for just a few minutes, but inevitably one guy will wake up, wake the other guy up and then they'll both fall asleep. And so, so then no watches for us and I, and they're supposed to go wake the, uh, the instructor up. So he's out there, he's going crazy. And there's still a couple of guys asleep. So I'm like, I, I was kind of dazed. And so I get in the push up position. I got this blanket over me and he's making us do push ups and all this stuff. And so that blanket falls off me. And I'm completely naked doing push ups. And he's like talking and yelling and screaming. And all of a sudden he stops. And he looks over, he goes, what, the, who is that? Is that that seal? And he looks <laughs> over there and, uh, and I was like, who y'all instructor. And so he's like, all right, everybody just get up. So everybody was thanking me because I saved them from getting any more beating that day, but it came at a price, which was really interesting. Uh, crazy story. But, but that is when you're in ranger school, uh, or when you're going through these types of, uh, of training in these situations, that right there, that sense of humor and, uh, and making the, the most out of these situations that's in life as well. That's how you get through life. That's how you get through these yeah, things. You know, so. I, I've, I've been, when I spoke to McBee at the time and uh, I started listening to some more podcasts in preparation to, to speak to him, that's one thing that came up. You Navy SEALs have a sense of humor over the morbid and discussed it. That may, you know, just it, it's funny after a while because you just, there's nothing that you can't make fun of and laugh at. I'm, I'm telling you, when we were in Hell Week, um, I looked over at my friend. I was having on Wednesday night of Hell Week when most people quit. This is in SEAL training. We hadn't slept since Sunday morning. Sure, and, since you're uh, hallucinating, you're seeing things that oh, don't yeah. exist. It's craziness. It's crazy. And people get sick really bad. And so, but I was, you know, it, for me, it was a huge awakening. And I realized that night, Wednesday night, when everybody's quitting, I, I was just smiling. My friend looked at me, he goes, why are you smiling? He thought I was kind of hallucinating. I said, you know what? I know now for sure there's nothing that they can do to make me quit. I will not quit. I said, I am going to make this. And this is like only the, I don't remember at that point in time, the third or fifth week of training. I was like, I know I'm going to make this. I'm, I was excited about it, right? I look over at my friend, Scott, who had gotten pneumonia and some kind of weird sickness and infection. His head was as round as a basketball and he was crying. And I looked over at him and he looked at me. I go, are you okay? He goes, I don't know if I'm going to make it, man. So the, the, the difference between the two stories at that point, and let me tell you, I never let him live that down because. Wait, did he, did he, quit, did he quit or not? Oh, no, he made it through. Oh. He, he, he so just persevered. All, all, all the power to him. All the power to him. Miserable, miserable the whole time. Um, they will pull you out sometimes and give you antibiotics and uh, sit you, believe it or not, in a hot tub or give you warm IVs to get your body core temperature back up. And then they'll ask you, with donuts and coffee sitting in front of you. Do you want to go back into training or do you want to stay here? And guys will you know, like Scott, you know, say, I'm going back, man, send me back. And so he came back. I'm telling you for the rest of his career, his big head, you know, that was his nickname. So. Big head. You know, I was reading something about uh, one part of how week that they just stop at a certain point, I guess, when you're done, because they found the 10% of the class or sometimes even less. And you guys would rather die than ever quit. That you hit the point. There's no stopping you. In Hell Week, they've determined that seven days is pretty much the max that a human being can go with no sleep. And they they take us to about uh, almost six days. So they take us right to the edge. And, um, you know, we listen, we had a guy die when I was in training. Uh, John Racine, I, I believe is his name. Um, uh, he, you know, this guy was in his 20s and he died in the swimming pool doing an exercise that guy took his passion and his willingness to serve the country to the bitter end. You know, that's these guys that show up. You know, so, some, of the, some of these country boys never seen water before and they, they don't even know how to swim and they're going yeah. in and doing these insane, uh, um, what do you call them? Um, drown proofing uh, and drown, they, drown proofing. And then the, the battle down, you know, at the bottom to get your gear off and your wrestling. <laughs> another, 
it, it, it's just absolutely crazy. And and I, I watched, uh, this is just on YouTube, some of these guys actually drowning, and then the divers bring them up to the surface and, and bring them back like, God. So that, the, that's the 50-meter underwater swim, which is yeah. kind of the thing that nobody talks about really, but because it's very quick, but it is probably – next to hell week, the thing that gets most people that in pole comp kicked out. And uh, because you got to jump in the water, do a front flip underwater and you can't surface. So you're going to lose air when you do that. And then you got to swim to the other side of the pool, which is 25 meters. You can turn around and kick off that and then come back. And so it's on the way back that, that a lot of people pass out. And as long as they touch the wall, uh, they pass. So if they're out, it doesn't matter if they're knocked out or not, they won't touch them for a few seconds and they'll oh let them, if they gosh. float and touch that wall, they pull them out, you revive them and then they're passed. Wow. So, wow. 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 If not, they got to get back in there and do it again, which yeah. really sucks. Yeah. yeah. I was listening to some podcast of uh, Navy SEALs and they were mentioning that pool con was the worst, worst possible thing to do. Yeah. Worst. It's, I mean, pool comp in and of itself is where, you know, you, you go through this, this uh, comprehensive, um, test underwater uh, to show that you have been listening to what they've been teaching you and it all comes that they do all these surf hits like they'll come underwater and they'll twist you up and turn you around rip your mask off no, 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 be, no, I, I watch it they, they basically wrestle you and beat you up it's not yeah. any they beat the crap out of you it's just like the ocean does when you get caught in a, in a wave so then you got to keep crawling and eventually what it comes down to is are you following again this is what i was talking about in ranger school it's are you following instruction, even in a crisis situation? So it comes down to the whammy knot, which uh, uh, they'll take you, they wrestle you all over the place, and they'll rip your um, your uh, regulator out of your regulator out of your mouth. And at that point, you're holding breath. So they let you know they're going to go like this, and you take a huge breath. They rip that out of your mouth. They spin you all over. And then they leave you alone like you're you're out of the wave, right? And so you have to then take your gear off in such a way that they have instructed you to do all while holding your breath. And you've already been wrestling around, so you've lost a tremendous amount of air. And you, from the point they do this and take that out of your mouth, you have about a minute and a half before you're going to go to the surface minimum. So, and that's after being tossed all over. So you have to take your gear off in a certain way. You have to stow it on the bottom in a certain way, put your weight belt on there and then take your tanks off, put it on there. Uh, and then you kiss the bottom of the pool and you give a thumbs up or you give an okay. And then a thumbs up so you can go up. Then the instructor comes down and inspects everything you did. Make sure that you tried to turn your air off. Then he will, uh, uh, He'll, I can't remember exactly what it is, but he, t he does something to you. You give him a thumbs up. And then if they really want to push it, they'll sit there and just stare at you or they'll act like they saw something over here. <laughs> Meanwhile, you're like, you know, you're, you're like gasping, you know, trying to get, you're just like starting to choke because your, your body's wanting to force you to breathe. It's so bad that on the way up, they start punching you in the stomach to get oh, wow. any air. So your lungs don't explode. Um, and then you come up out of it and then, and if you make it through that, then you've passed, I, I think probably one of the three big tests in, in, uh, in buds. You know, I, I was, I was, I forgot where I heard this, uh, Marcus Luttrell, when he was talking about Lone Survivor, when he was talking mm -hmm. about, uh, the last, uh, when he was, all his men were killed and he's, his back is broken and he's struggling back to the village. He said, this was worse than 20 hell weeks or something to that effect. Where oh, yeah. Hell Week doesn't even do it. You know, that didn't even, imagine without that training of Hell Week, but Hell Week didn't even represent what reality was. Yeah, well, you know what Marcus went through, if you saw that movie, uh, all that was during the day in the movie, but all that in reality was at night. And he crawled for several days with a broken back. And I think the biggest thing, the difference was that in Buds, even though we did have somebody die in training, you, you know that you can quit at any time. You know, you, you can say, okay, this is enough for me. I'm out. Uh, you, you have the feeling that if, if you were to die, they were going to revive you. With uh, Marcus and what he went through is um, there was no guarantee on anything. I mean, God, I think, really shined down on him that day when he was saved uh, by those guys, uh, by that one, uh, that one villager. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but 
everything that he went through. I mean, imagine, imagine for all the people watching this, imagine if, uh, if you're like me, you don't really have five friends. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a loner, but if you have five friends and I'm not talking about Facebook friends, five <laughs> good friends or close relatives murdered in front of you, then you get blown up, your back broke and you have to choose. Do I crawl my way out of here? Not knowing if you're going to die anytime you're crawling or do you just stay put and crawl up into that, you know, safe zone inside of you. And, and Marcus chose to crawl and get out of there. And um, it's, it's pretty phenomenal when you, when you try to envision that, especially the, you know, the, the thing I think he was, I think it was um, Axelson. I think that's who he was talking about. It's been a while since I went over that story, but uh, at one point during the firefight, he looked up and um, half of his head was blown away and he was still shooting. I mean, that's the, that's the kind of, um, focus that you have, you know, when I talked about ranger school after seal training, that's the type of focus that you get from going through this train, this interesting training that somehow they created where even in these situations, you know, you're focused on what, what the mission is and what you have to achieve. That's your focus. We, we had uh, Mark Geist on the, on the um, podcast early on and uh, Mark of uh, Benghazi in um, 2012 and uh, he was his his left arm was blown off, was holding on by a thread where he, it was ninety degrees hanging off, and he goes, I kept trying to flip it up to keep shooting. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's just it's just absolutely astounding. Well, you know what you're capable of doing in those situations, you know, and it's what and you see. Here's the thing: human beings are like this. If I teach you how to change a tire uh, on a car, and then you have a flat you're going to know how to change that tire, even in winter or, you know, if it's blistering hot outside, we go through these trainings and we do it in a, in a way like pull comp, which I just described, or the situation, even the situation where I'm doing the pushups naked. And, you know, you're going through situations that are uh, very difficult and very tough. And you're learning how to function and use a set of skills in that type of environment so that when you're put in it, you have guys that will pull their arm up and try to shoot or have half their head blown off and still stay in the fight or crawl, you know, for three days to get back uh, to safety. I mean, these are individuals that even though, like Marcus said, it doesn't even buds doesn't even compare to that. What it did was buds put uh, in ranger school puts the ability uh, in you where, where they're not just teaching you, or they're not just coming out and uh, and giving you a fish. They're teaching you how to fish. And then when you're in that environment, you if you rise to the occasion and use that training, it it pays off. So these skills, once you once you're reprogrammed, you're you're really taking your mind and programming it differently. Going through life, it, it must be. I'm not going to say this in a glib way, but it must be comforting to know when you faced adversity throughout your life, because we all do, that this mm -hmm. training just kicks in and you and you focus on the mission. Whatever that might be. It, it, well, I tell you, if I'm in charge, yes. Uh, it's very difficult working in an environment where other people are, are in charge and you you see through the stress. You see through uh, the desires of money or things like that. And you see that this is what the end goal is and this is where we are. And I know that, you know, standard operating procedures, um, task organization, and I understand all these things in a stressful environment regular civilians may not. And ha the hardest part for me is not being in charge of, of something. It is not being in charge of something and not trying to micromanage people or, or say, Hey, I think I would do it this way. Because as, as one thing I did learn in the SEAL teams versus BUDS is that you can have in, in an officer in the SEALs, which is like, you know how they say her herding cats. This is like trying to herd lions or wild pit bulls. So um, when you could take uh, 20 highly trained individuals and uh, teach them tactics that are okay, but if they do them to the best of their ability and they do them in a uniform standardized manner, they're going to be lethal. But you could teach all 20 guys how to do incredible things, but if they all want to do it themselves, it's a miserable and failed experience. So that's the hardest part for me is, is a civilian is 
people are just not interested in, in me teaching them that they're just really not. And that the FBI was in the, and the air marshals were a horrendous experience because of that. You know, that, that was the hardest part for me was watching people reinvent things that they just did a year ago. And now they're going to reinvent it and do the same mistakes over and over. Right, right, right. Yeah, I, I definitely could see that. All right. So you, 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 U.S. Navy SEAL, what, five years or so? Yeah. And, yeah, and you- I was in Central, Central South America doing the counter drugs, counter narcotics. 9-11 hadn't happened. And then it did happen. And uh, they didn't use us. They weren't, believe it or not, SEALs were not being deployed when it first happened. I mean, some SEALs were. Dev Group was over there. Um, some of the West coast teams were over there, but by and large, they were not being used until the war spun up for several years. And at that point I was older, you know, I went through, uh, buds at 28. So at that point I was in my thirties and I knew if I ever wanted to get to federal law enforcement, which was my end goal, that I was going to have to make a jump at some point in five years, the air marshals opened up. And so I made that jump. So the air marshals were after nine 11, you, you, I think you started in uh, 02. 2002. Right. Yeah. So for those of you who don't remember, or a little too young, but I do remember this clearly, is you went on a plane after 9-11, and your situational awareness, you're just looking at everybody. I remember I, I, I went on one plane, and I, I was uh, about 20 pounds heavier, and I told the flight attendant, tell me where you want me to be, and I'll be there. I'm here for. I'm here to get your – because you're just looking at everything, and I, I most of the flight – it was, it was to California. I just kept standing up and looking around. I was walking up and down the aisles. And I said, you know, uh, it was just a high day. And you were, you were the guy on the plane to prevent the next 9-11. Yeah. So you were and, the- and I'll tell you, there's two, two, two flights that I remember more than anything. I mean, we had crazy stuff happen. We definitely saw people targeting the planes. I mean, there were, I believe, you know, we didn't clarify this for sure, but we saw a lot of people. Um, for instance, uh, having lived in New York at that period in time, I, I got to know, uh, some people who are in the Hasidic, Hasidic community and we would have, uh, individuals that would come on planes half dressed as somebody who was Hasidic, uh, and, or Orthodox. And, and it wasn't, some of them wouldn't even get on the plane. They would just walk around the airport and then leave. And there were, you know, things that were happening. A uh, man walk. I remember one time a man walking through the airport in Chicago with a, a red suitcase with one wheel on it, dragging it all over the place. To, to me, that is a sign of somebody who is trying to communicate with it. That's an intel thing. You know, he's trying to say that here I am, I'm here, I'm doing this. If he's trying to communicate with other people without communicating with them. And there was a lot of oddities like that. But two, two, to- two flights I remember more than anything as an air marshal. One wait, 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 Jonathan, before you go on yeah. a second, as an air marshal, are you on the yeah. plane first? Are you before the passengers come on? Uh, I can't get into that because those are, those are tactics that are okay, classified. Got it. But, second, yeah. you have, if you're allowed to answer, you have a weapon on you. Always. Okay. So yeah. you're the guy, if anything like this happens, no one knows who you are, and yeah. you have, I guess, low-velocity bullets or something so that you don't puncture oh. the plane. Nope, you, you could take out any any threat <laughs> any threat on the plane. Regular regular bullets, re- regular gun, and um, you know which was another thing that we had to worry about. You know, if I shoot a skinny terrorist, is it going to go through him and and hit grandma? Uh, is it going to uh, puncture a hole in the side of the plane, which isn't as dangerous as you think? I mean, it, it can cause a loss of uh, air pressure. Uh, of air pressure, but probably not going to be catastrophic. Uh, but you got to wonder if, if the terrorist is in front of you and you uh, shoot at them. If you miss or if you, again, hit them and it goes through them, uh, what if it hits a pilot? You know, I mean, there there were you had to be very tactically proficient in, in that job, which sometimes I question some of the people that let through there. But but overall, you know, I was qualified. I knew I was ready. You know, when when we used to travel well, it's back in the day when I started doing Israel in 1985 was my first trip. Israel always had LL always had uh, air marshals. Absolutely. And the thing ones you, you the joke with the game we used to play was try to pick out the air marshals. We were always wrong. We never picked them out. You know, we'd say that guy because he didn't sleep. That guy. And we woke up and we find out that they weren't the air marshals. You couldn't pick them out. One flight we went uh, in Israel. We were the only people on the plane. It was it wasn't a charter flight, so you knew who the guy was. He's sitting there, and you you would never I would never have picked this guy to be an air marshal. 
totally unassuming. He looked like an old grandfather type. Uh, right. I, I, and this guy was the real deal. And you would never know it. It's just absolutely seamless. So uh, um, I think it was on is, is most Israeli flag. I think all El Al always had uh, air marshals. I don't know. You know that much better than me. Yeah. But, um, but this is the thing about Israel. See, Israel does things because they're effective or because they're needed. You know, it, Israel and El Al, they do profile people. 100%. They do ask questions. They put people on a plane using a firearm that is adequate for that job. They pick people who are unassuming. You know, in the United States, you know, we we could throw thousands of air marshals on a plane that and they don't screen them properly. Maybe they're hiring them because of uh, racial quotas. You know, they don't think tactically at all. Yeah. Even yeah. the firearm that we carried was not the appropriate gun for that. You know, it was. This was this is a friend of mine in the Israeli army told me that they have uh, it was that's why I mentioned it. Low velocity bullets, special guns designed mm -hmm. for that where it doesn't ricochet as much and the whole bunch of things. Of course, you couldn't tell me everything, but yeah. you're fighting in a tube in the sky with little children and old people. And right. these guys, uh, the accuracy, you know, but just before you're getting on the plane, I'm a civilian, I'm going on. You're questioned. Did any, is the, did you pack, did you, did you right. uh, uh, pack the suitcase? Was it ever out of your sight? Where were you going? And one of my sons who uh, they were questioning or something and they started going, they started speaking to him in Hebrew because he had, they looked at the passport, they looked at his past. They want, he didn't look like he ever went to Israel before, but they started speaking in Hebrew and he responded. And he goes, well, we just wanted to make sure. All these little right. cues. And I asked a friend of mine who happened to be in the Israeli army at the time, I could have said anything. He goes, no, no, they're watching your respiration. They're watching your eyes. They're watching yes. how your carries off. So don't worry. <laughs> they're not, you're not getting by them at anything. And they're highly, highly trained. And they right. put a sticker so it's their name on your bag. And it's their responsibility. If anything ever happens, it was on their watch. For that it's, particular it's statement analysis. You know, polygraphers use the same thing when they do a polygraph. It's not so much the machine, it's the interview. And then the machine after the interview so they can measure your responses to these things. And that's the way that, you know, these uh, interviewers who are profiling, that's how they work. I mean, we've gotten to this point in this nation where, we do things uh, that are absolutely just mind-boggling, ridiculous, or incompetent uh, strictly because we, we want to make people feel good. And they think that safety take is second, you know, takes second uh, base to that. When in fact, you know, if you want to be free, you have to be secure. And uh, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I could talk about this all day, how good and effective Israel is as opposed to the United States. And it all comes down to this repetitive political and media narrative that uh, everything in order to be equal, that uh, reality uh, should not matter. You know, it doesn't matter if realistically there's a threat by this group of people. It doesn't matter if the majority of people that are killing individuals in this nation are doing it with guns that they got uh, ill, you know, received illegally. Um, they're not going to focus on that. They're going to focus on the things that politically make them feel good or make their constituents feel good. And in Israel, it's not that's not going to be the case. Safety, uh, it, it's, you know, because I remember right after 9-11, they had all these things. These guys could never have gotten on the plane. They would have been shut down before as they bought the ticket because Israel immediately uh, knows everything about you as soon as you buy the ticket. Traveling yeah. one-way tickets, no luggage, males, Arabs. All the countries that they came from previously right. went to Yemen. Insane, insane. And here they went on a plane and sat in first class or right near the captain. And, and that's yeah, it. We I, paid the price. And we paid the price. And it was all, you know, they were sure to ask that day. I'm sure all those terrorists on 9-11 were asked, did you carry your luggage in? Did you ever let anybody else touch you? I mean, useless questions. Useless. And then they were screened at the, at the security screening like everyone else. But that's not how they got all the knives on board, you know. So these are things that uh, in that day and age and even now, the, the biggest problem we have here is smoke and mirrors. They will do things. And trust me, I've been privy to this uh, running the special events uh, unit for uh, the FBI here in New York for all these different events that occurred. You know, I was the guy on the ground doing the threat assessments, uh, liaisoning with other departments and agencies and civilian companies. And it 
it's shocking how comfortable we are in this nation with smoke and mirrors. Let's appease these people or let's make it look like it's safe. And therefore the bad guys probably won't do anything here. That's the way most people think. And it's a very dangerous way. Israel is not like that. You know, if somebody, if somebody pulls up to a bus stop and uh, gets out of the car and starts checking the engine, it's there. People are going to notify authorities and they're going to get away from there. They don't have to be told. In the United States, I, I remember one time driving to work uh, in my bureau car, and I had to go through Times Square to get to the office. And there was uh, the the mayor, De, um, not De Blasio, it was Bloomberg at the time, giving a press conference, surrounded by his bodyguards and their Hercules team, which is guys that are all up armored. And literally fifty yards away, a guy was working on his car with the hood up. And I was shocked. Nobody was even looking at the guy. And I, I finally pulled up and I told one of the officers was there, I flashed my creds and I was like, does anybody see that guy working on his vehicle right there where a bomb almost went off a year ago? And they were like, they went over there and questioned the guy. I just got out of there, but that's the way we are in this nation. We're, we're so focused on smoke and mirrors and on what this popular politician is saying that we, we don't even realize the reality of the threat. We, we went, uh, this is back in 2010, we went to uh, uh, the Dominic, Dominican Republic and we had five kids, my mm. wife and I, and they put my wife aside for a thorough body search just as a random thing. I said, who thought this made any sense? And then right after us, there was about a 90-year-old lady in a wheelchair that they made get up. <laughs> yeah. Like, I just don't get it. Listen, it's funny you bring up Dominican Republic because the Dominican Republic is a perfect example of the way we live in this country. You know, you go there, you stay on the, the compound or whatever hotel you're at, and everybody has a great time. They love it. I can't wait to get back here. If they were to step even a mile away from that place, they would never want to come back to they, the they tell you, They tell you don't leave. They tell yeah. you do not leave the compound. And, and you don't, you know, I always walked in the morning at sunrise around the whole entire thing. It was a club med. And all these guards are all over these areas. And I, you, and I didn't know, you know anything about that. And I said, I want to go out jogging over this. Is no, 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 no. <laughs> you stay here. You That's stay here. In, in the United States? No, all, these people, all these people who protest and they say that, you know, there's a cops are shooting black people and this and that. If they just went and spent uh, a couple of days or even a night in the inner city on the 75th precinct in New York, where every night automatic fire uh, automatic weapons are firing into the sky, you know, they would maybe see things a little bit different from their, you know, their ivory palace that they live in uh, and their protests, which never go into the inner city. Maybe they might, some of them might see things differently, but it's very similar. Well, you see the, the just a couple of months ago, a two year old shot at a birth at a birthday party, a stray bullet, a mother just absolutely is and we just week at McDonald's in Chicago. McDonald's yeah. a little girl got shot and killed. And her dad. You know? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Crazy, crazy, crazy. The inner city and what we're going through in this nation and the nonsense that is spilling out is uh after going through all the stuff that I've gone through and seeing what, f what the reality of freedom is and what it takes to sustain that freedom. The majority of people that are born here never do anything to earn their freedom or to protect it. And in fact, they are utilized by these power hungry leftists and different individuals to actually uh, to carry out their subversive uh, rhetoric yeah. and their echo chambers. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's one thing to live in the suburbs and talk about police brutality. It's another thing to live in the inner city and it's these people who would need the police. <laughs> they, they, yeah. they, it's their they're getting killed. They're 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 kids, and yeah. it just really screwed when up. When they did away with stop and frisk, which I talk about in Sheet No More, when they which did away worked, with stop which worked which worked amazingly well. If you're a bad guy, you know that you could be caught any time. They publicly did away with that, and what did they do? That was a public announcement to bad people that be big. You're, hey, carry an illegal weapon. You're fine now. Yeah, that that was just amazing. How you know? I remember back in the day, I've, we had a paranoid friend of ours. He he never liked the easy pass. He goes because they follow you. <laughs> you know, first of all, I said, "Who's they? The government." All right, even if so, but if you're not doing anything bad, why am I worried about that? Why why would what would I care? 
You know, there, you know, all the privacy things. If it's for my safety and my family's safety, where where does the scale tip when my privacy or my safety? Safety wins every single time. So it's funny that you bring that up because um, everybody's always worried, like during the um, Patriot Act, for instance, what the NSA was looking at or the FBI or CIA. Uh, The reality is the only people in government that are that are obsessed with what everyone is thinking and everyone is doing are the politicians and the people that they appoint. Right. The rest of the government is are people that are busy doing their job. If you really want to be scared, you need to realize that whether the Patriot Act was here or gone, every time I, when I was in the FBI and I, I got a warrant to get you know uh, a Title III to listen to what somebody was doing, or if uh, one of my friends who's on counterterrorism went and got a FISA warrant to, uh, that's the secret um, uh, warrant so that they can go do listening devices or follow somebody. We didn't go to the NSA to get that information. We went to... Verizon or AT&T. We went to the cable companies. We went to OnStar for Chevy. We, those companies collect every bit of the information that the NSA gets. It's not the NSA you should be worried about. It is Google. Silicon Valley <laughs> right. watches at Google. They watch everything that you do. If you haven't gone on Netflix, uh, uh, because a lot of people don't, I would go on Netflix and watch, uh, there's two shows on there, and I'm forgetting what they're called, but they're about uh, social media. The social experiment, I think it's one, and I can't remember the other one, but these are uh, people from Silicon Valley that won't even let their children use any social media. Because everything is tracked. Yeah, I watched one of them. I think it was the first one, the social experiment, where they show how the algorithms yeah. algorithms work. And this That's one, it. since you watched on this Instagram, then odds are you're going to watch this. Let me show you this one. Yes, success. Right. I think it's going down. Yeah. It's scary. And it, it's uh, I, I tweeted this out last night, and, and I knew when I was tweeting it, it might be a little controversial. But some people have actually responded quite well, is that when it comes to these mass shootings, they're, ha- it, they're happening now at a blistering pace. And uh, the thing about when human beings do um, uniform behavior, uh, because human beings have free will. So when, when human beings present a repeated behavior amongst a large group of people, you know that there is a popularized influence somewhere. Somebody is influencing the masses. And so I challenge people to stop and ask, what is it that's influencing people in the past two months to do this many mass shootings, because it's not, it's not gun rights. It's not, um, it's not conservatism or the Republican party. This, this is something that's being pumped into people's brains, crazy or not. And uh, they are repeating a behavior that is not natural to a human being killing, regardless of what people think killing is not a natural behavior for a human being to do to somebody else. It's not, it's, it takes a tremendous amount of will to take the life of one or more people. And so this is a behavior that's being repeated over and over. And I I can't help but think that there's some kind of controlled influence is happening to people as crazy as that sounds. Some kind of controlled influence is occurring in this nation to cause this. It's just too uniformed. When you say control, you're not talking about the maturing candidate or anything brainwashing. What are you talking about? Well, I don't know. So I have a friend who, uh, you know, these comedians who hypnotize people on stage. I know we've, and I actually went on stage once. It didn't work on me. I know somebody that it did work on. And it took about a minute for them not to be able to open their mouth. The comedian said, the, the harder you're a hypnotist, but he said, the harder you try to open your mouth, and say something, the harder it will be for you to say or open your mouth. And it freaked them out. And uh, that took about a minute and a half. You know, for 20 years or more, we've been inundated by indoctrination through television. Social media has gone exponentially faster. The Department of Education uh, is a leftist entity. All these things are occurring and they're repeating the same narratives over and over again. And I can't help but think video games as well, all these things compiled. I I just can't help but think that there's some message in there 
over 20 years that's getting into people's brains if they have, uh, you know, some type of issue with their mind or their substance abusers, something is reacting. And when I say controlled, that narrative is controlled. I'm not saying that they have a remote or they're saying a keyword on television that's going to key people in to go shoot. But I do believe that the control of this narrative that's pumped out consistently, which is a false narrative to control the people, just like in um, that social dilemma show where they use algorithms to literally get us to do certain things. Or respond to certain ways. And they know that if you do A, B, C, 95% probability you'll do E. When, when they talked about, which I thought was fascinating, um, if you've ever texted somebody and then at the bottom you see the little three dots that go like this, they created that to keep you engaged in, in, to engage in the right. conversation. Right. That is a form of programming. Right. So if, if that, those little three dots, that's one little thing, right? If that can control that many people, we're talking about every person that ever owns a phone, they see those three dots, they... You're not going to turn your phone off and put it down. You're going to sit there with your phone in your face. If they can do that, that easily, that simply, something is going on here in the programming of people to where their concept of life and death and uh, their urge to kill versus their urge to work it out is totally off the charts. And I can't, I, I can't help but think from, after all the things that I've been through, what I've been taught and trained and programmed, I've been programmed, uh, you know, Marco Satrell was programmed. A, a normal human being is not, is going to cur- curl up and say, I quit with a broken back after seeing five people murdered. You know, he was programmed not to quit and he kept going and kept going. I think something is happening along the way where uh, people are just, I don't know. It's too uniform. You know, know, Jonathan, you know, it's, if this was about 20 years ago, I'd be laughing at you. But when you read and just look at what's out there, look at the information that's out there, all those people for years that were saying they're following us, I'm being tracked, I'm being this, I'm being that. They're right. (laughs) You know, you know what I'm saying? They turned out to be right. There, and and it, so, may not be government. it may not be government. No, it's, I don't care who it is. There was always like they're following me. The paranoid people were considered, you know, a little off. But it's just when I watch. You know what, a, pardon? You know, what, you know what other show that just, I mean, blew me away was Turn, T-U-R-N. That's the, the show on Netflix about uh, the revolution. And the, oh, the spies. revolution, right, right. Yeah, and, and uh, Washington spies. I was, and, I was thinking that the, the Americans was about uh, the. The um, the culpa ring. Yes. But so, this, this was turned at the uh, Revolutionary War. Was that? You, this show is about the culpa ring. It's about that spy ring for, for George Washington. Turn, right. Turn, yeah. yeah. And so the, the thing that hit me about that was that um, the reason that the, the, the Third Amendment was created, right? We, we all know the First Amendment, you know, a free speech, Second Amendment, right to arm, bear arms, bodyguard of all the other amendments. The Third Amendment which is there'll, there'll be no quartering in your home. You know, these day and age, people are like quartering. quartering. What is that? You know, I'm not worried about a soldier living in my house, but they don't realize that the marriage between Silicon Valley and the government is such that they are quartering in your home and they can, through this device right here or the computer that we're on, they can spread social norms that are, you know, created by them or this type of indoctrination to the point where if you're afraid to say, I remember one time talking about Vicks vapor rub to somebody cause they didn't feel good. And I went on Instagram and there was a commercial for Vicks, Vicks vapor rub on Instagram, you know? So you, you can have your life ruined because you text the wrong thing. You can uh, you go on a social media site and, uh, build, you know, all your friends that you haven't known for 20 years from high school and you say the wrong thing and boom, you're gone. Never to communicate with those people again. They, they are quartering in your home right now, whether you realize it or not. And that, when I was watching that show and I was watching that, that uh, British soldier tell the family, I don't think that this conversation is appropriate. You need to change this conversation. I was like, Wow. That just happened to me in my own home, but in a different form. It's in electronic form. Uh, so Alexa, you know, ask Alexa. Oh, I, 
I made my mom take her Alexis and, uh, Alexa and throw it out the door. I wouldn't allow that in her house. Yeah. Crazy. All right. You know what, man? I, I could definitely speak to you for hours, but I want to get right to your book, Sheep No More, The Art of Awareness and Attack Survival. It's hey, been called, there it is right <laughs> behind you. It's been called uh, The Definitive Safety Bible. Why did you write this book? So I realized when I was in the FBI and well, actually I realized this when I was working for AMTI after I left the air marshals and I created a, uh, a soft target awareness course uh, for Homeland security. They gave us the course because this was a contracting firm of all former seals and other military special forces. And they said, we want you to teach this course. They had already created it and it was created to go to people and say, Hey, if an attack happens, here's how you should react. And, and my complaint with that was that, what good does that do? You know, that that's really first responder uh, and and how to uh, how to deal with something after it's occurred. How do we prevent these things from happening? How do we really give people the knowledge to prevent attacks? And so they let me finagle it, and I turned it into a course where I was going and, and literally teaching people in all these different um, soft targets. Uh, stadiums and arenas, churches and synagogues, malls, theaters, uh, tall buildings. And we would bring the managers in and I would teach them how to look at themselves and their facilities from the attacker's point of view. And it was, uh, it was pretty amazing what we got back from this. I mean, it was uh, the, the president, President Bush at the time, uh, would get a review of these courses and and would get, you know, what the statistics were in this, because this was huge. This was in 2003 when I'm teaching this stuff and 2004, uh, it was making a huge difference. I left to go in the FBI in 2005 and that course immediately stopped because they, the powers that be didn't have the push that I had. And uh, cause I just wouldn't quit with this course. I, I, I argued for this course. And so when I left, they stopped it and I, and I heard about that. And so I said, you know what, I need to write a book. But it wasn't until uh, 2013 that I started writing the book, basically wanting to teach people the same thing I had taught these executives. And because I learned through the FBI that there was this huge chasm from my knowledge to law enforcement and then from law enforcement to the civilians. And so from my experience to the civilians was like basically – you know, like trying to teach a five-year-old how to secure their home. Okay, so give, give me give me an example for a second. I'm a civilian. You're here at your top of the food chain in terms of knowledge and experience. I'm a civilian. You're looking at the entrance to my building. What am I seeing and what are you seeing? Tell me what I'm seeing first. So uh, you're seeing the door that you enter into to go to work. That's it. I'm, I'm, looking, at the, I'm looking at that. I'm looking at the counter where they make you sign in if you're a guest. Uh, the banks of elevators and the turnstile and showing my badge. That's all I'm, I'm saying. Look, I'm looking at the location where the majority of people will amass at a certain time of the day. I could sit there and watch it in the morning and people are going to flow in in the morning, but by and large in the, in the afternoon when people leave either at lunch or more, even more predictably is at the end of the day, that bottleneck is going to be the most populated area uh, and uh, area of attack for that building. And so, and also if somebody comes in, that's important. I know that that's probably where they're going to enter and where they're going to exit from. And uh, if they do enter, then I know that's where they're probably going to exit from. And so that becomes a big bottleneck. See, that's the way I look at this from the attacker's point of okay, view. So hang on, hang on a second. So if at five fifteen, most of the office this back be pre COVID come down in the elevators and they get bottled up near the turnstiles waiting to get out. Right. right. Let's just say it, that's where that's where the bottleneck occurs. You're focusing on that because that's where you have the most amount of people. That's where someone could get in and out without any type of attention being drawn to them. And that's where an attack can take place. That's where an attack. That is a critical area. The critical time would be 515. Uh, the critical assets are the people. Uh, the vulnerabilities are that that's a bottleneck. And the avenue of approach is walking straight in. So uh, getting as close to that as I can get with uh, an explosive or a gun um, or a knife. And so that's the way I look at everything. I look at, uh, you know, my life when I go to the movies, I, when I sitting in my own home, I look at when I'm uh, driving down the road on a motorcycle, you know, where would, where is the most likely 
place and time that I could have an accident when somebody coming out from a side road or something like that. So you can, it, it's not just terrorist attackers. It could be a rapist. It could be a, a pedophile. And here's the interesting thing I talk about in the book is that, you know, a seal is a direct action attacker. And so a, uh, somebody who is a, a rapist or somebody who is going to uh, carry a terrorist attack or rob you, those are direct action missions. Like they study the tactics, they wait for the opportunity and they strike. A CIA agent is somebody who goes out and let's say this picture behind me is a nuclear power plant in Iran. They don't need to take the whole thing down. You see my eyeball right here. Let's say that that's a critical area in the nuclear power plant. They'll spend a tremendous amount of time recruiting somebody that works in that area, developing a relationship with them and slowly working their way into that person so they can flip them and then get them to do their work for them. And that's the way a pedophile works. A pedophile will go to church. They'll go to school meetings. They'll do what befriend families and slowly work their way in because they're just looking for that child. They're not interested in the family. And so they'll work their way in using the same type of long-term assault. It's an attack, it's the same thing. You, what the book shows you is how you can structure uh, your, uh, your behavior, uh, not your behavior, it's the way you can structure your outlook of your life in each sector of your life and say, if I was an attacker, who would attack this? Why would you want to attack my family or attack my home? Maybe you have money or you have a nice car or maybe you have a child. Those are two different attacks. So then you look at them and you say, what's the critical asset, the car, the child? Uh, what, what is the um, most likely person, a pedophile or a robber? So this is a direct action. This is a long-term attack right here. So we start looking at ways that they will, you know, the avenue of approach the, the best time, the best location to get access to those things. And you can do that with every single aspect of your life. And once you do that, it becomes a switch that you, you don't have to go in this long drawn out, you know, plan every time, but you can literally walk in somewhere and say, okay, I'm at a concert. There's little I can do at this point, but I do know from history that most of the attacks at concerts happen outside and they happen right before or typically right after uh, an event. So I'm gonna wait 10 minutes until this is over or I'm gonna leave 10 minutes before everybody else and, I, and I'm gonna be probably safe. And I'm gonna exit from this area because everybody else comes out here. You, you're doing that because you're thinking like the attacker. You know, so without even reading your book before I even met you, every time I went to a movie theater, I always knew where the two exits were. And I right. always sat within a, a crow's fly distance where I could just run straight out to a thing because it always frightened me. Even since I was a little kid, dark space, anything could happen mm -hmm. and you won't see it coming. So I always used to sit in the back where most people sit in the middle. I always sit on the end seat and I'm always facing an exit. And I know if it's in front of me, behind me, to the side of me, usually in front of me so I could see it. And I am constantly, I don't know, it's just my way my brain works since I was a kid because I was a scaredy cat, but I'm always scanning the crowd. It's, it's something because people, say, my kids go, why don't you sit in the middle? I go, I can't sit in the middle. I can be boxed in and have nowhere to run if there's an attack. You know, I, I am, I'm always thinking like that as well. But what I'm also thinking is if I'm the attacker, where am I going to enter and how am I going to carry out the attack? What's the most, and that's hard for people to think this way, but what's the most effective way that I can attack? And once you realize that, now you can start working backwards. You know what scared, what, what scared the crap out of me? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but for right. years, when I used to drive back and forth to the city, was the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel, now called the, uh, mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't know if they changed that name to uh, uh, you carry. No, no, the uh, Brooklyn Battery is oh, now Brooklyn changed. Battery. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You carry, the carry, you carry tunnel after Governor okay. Carey years and political okay. hack. Okay. Anyway. All you have to do is pull your car off to the side or just stop your car in the middle of the tunnel, backed up for miles, and you're in a tube, a mile-long tube. Thank God, yeah. and, and thank whoever is protecting us, that there has never been an attack in the Brooklyn Battery Tunnel because you're sitting ducks. It's you're just, sitting ducks. That's why when Chris Christie did that thing where he shut down the George oh Washington my God. Bridge, it was dangerous because it would have taken one person with a gun just walking down 
the cops couldn't have gotten to you. You could have killed thousands of people on that bridge. Scary as hell. Um, I don't remember what I was going to say though, but, uh, Oh, uh, sitting in a, in a movie theater, you know, thinking these like are an things. attacker. Thinking like an yeah. attacker. So, you know, with, with your wife, uh, someday or your kids or whatever, um, at night with all the lights off, like it would be in a movie theater. I want you to get the mo- the brightest flashlight. I don't have one right here with me, but they make flashlights right now that are super small and super bright. Okay. Uh, if you have a Nerf gun or you take a rolled up sock, okay. Come into the room and, and say, I'm going to attack you, but have them kind of hide and then hit you in the face with that flashlight, you know, turn it on right in your eyes. It's going to be difficult for you to see what to do. Right. You could hold the light out here where it's not next to your face. So if they did have a gun, but something as simple from the defensive standpoint is if I'm going to come in and I'm going to attack. And I know if I went into a theater, I'm going to roll left or roll right. Right. When I walk in there, because that's where people are. I'm going to start mowing people down. If you have a flashlight and you hit that person in the eye, it's going to give you a, a, a millisecond. You might be able to get down. You might be able to dart towards a door. Um, they might actually come at you with that with the weapon, which allows other people to get out of there. I mean, if you want to be a hero in that case, but the fact is there are things that you can do even in a theater where it's dark and you're vulnerable, you know, but the, the thing that you have to, to really get your mind behind here is that you have to, be aware. You have to be able to first walk into a place and say, there's always a potential for something, you know, the lottery, the, the, the possibility the, no, the probability, the number, the numbers game, the probability of you winning the lottery is slim, but the possibility is a hundred percent. You're just as possible to win as I am possible to win. So you have to look at the fact that I'm going to this movie theater, or I'm going to do this. It's a hundred percent possible. It could happen. So what am I going to do? Just have it in your brain real quick. If I was going to attack, where would I come from? Probably here. Okay. So that means I got to go this way. I got to move. You know, it's good to know things. If you ever get caught in a crossfire, if you can get into a hole 14 inches or deeper, your survivability goes up over 50%. You know, you need to know things like that. Don't go next to a wall if they're shooting. Or if you see somebody with a knife, don't stand there, run, because a knife attack is actually, you're less likely to survive a stabbing than you are a gunshot, mm. believe it or not. You know, so th- these are things that you, you should understand. And But I remember one time being in a movie theater, and there was a guy that was making all kinds of noise, and people just didn't want to be bothered by it, and they were like, shut up, shut up. I went down there, and he was having a, a um, an insulin attack. Mm. You know, the, the guy was out of it. And Whoa. so we ended up getting him out of there. He probably would have died had we not done something about it because I'm aware, you know, because I'm aware that that's not normal. And that's the biggest thing. I'll just say this. One of the thing is that whether it's the adventure of the team, little big, which is the other book I wrote for children, or if it's sheep, no more awareness is the greatest thing you can teach and the greatest thing you can learn. I don't need to teach you how to be a special forces guy. I don't need to do, if you're just aware and you kind of have an idea of where bad things can happen and you're aware you are most likely going to make it out. Okay. That's a, that's the biggest part in life. You're not going to be you know, swindled by somebody. You're not going to get caught up in scandal. You're uh, if something does occur, your first reaction isn't going to be to hide and quiver. You're going to, if you're aware, you're going to act versus react. You know, I, you know, you're spot on because, um, when I travel to other cities, they know by the way I just carry myself that I'm from New York. Mm-hmm. New York, have, we happen to be more aware. New Yorkers in general are more aware of their surroundings. Most people. Yeah. You yeah. do have a different swagger. You do have a different thing. You're a little, you're not, I'm not saying a country bumpkin, but you're not walking into where you could be swindled or we're a little sharper just because of the amount of people we, in our communities, the, the amount of a stimulus we have, the amount of exposure. It's not like living out in the country where you're not exposed. So, uh, when I happened to go to, a, it was Palm Beach a couple of years ago, and I'm driving, and he says, well, over here they have drug addicts. Wait, 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 wait. A New Yorker went to Palm Beach? I can't imagine. <laughs> <laughs> it was on business, totally on business. And the, and the, and the Uber driver said, you've got to be careful over here because there are drug addicts and there's halfway houses and stuff. I said, hey, I'm from New York. I goes, oh, forget it. I have to tell you. Like, no one's going to walk up to me and try to swindle. It's, we just right. have this kind of awareness of, of what's yeah. going on. And... Uh, and I, I think that, you know, kids today are starting to pick that up in a really big way. They're starting to, 
uh, the way I'm seeing it, they're much more, they're not as naive as we, as I was growing up. I, I would say in certain areas, like they're, they're much more street smart when it comes to, you know, yeah. things that can happen on the street. Yeah. But I think, I think children today, when it comes to awareness of the political games, those types of things, no, I think that they're no, being scammed no, left and right. No, no. Social media has in, in Hollywood, uh, especially social media in Silicon Valley has destroyed uh, children's ability to um, discern, discern evil from good or corruption from, uh, from people who are trying to do good things. You know, they, they do, just do not, they don't have the ability to, to discern that anymore. Yeah, it's getting tough. So you, you, the the book is Sheep No More, and I, I saw that was one. I got like zillions of great reviews on there. How long has that book been, book been out? A year or it two. It came out uh, December of two thousand seventeen. Wow. So it, you probably have amazing stories of people writing into you on how that book saved them. Oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, it's um, the the best story probably was a, a guy called in on when I was hosting a Sean Hannity radio show. And a guy called in and said his uh, 10-year-old son had read it, which I don't know what that says about my writing abilities, but actually I wanted it to be, I That's wrote good. it so that, yeah. so that everybody could read it. Yeah. So he said the 10-year-old kid read the whole thing. And now he goes around making sure that the doors are locked on the car or the house, that his windows shut at night. And he's, he's not just doing that because it's a habit. He's aware of who would attack, how they would do it, when it would occur, and the avenue of approach. And he's aware of that at 10 years old. He's not scared. He's not afraid. Um, he does what he needs to do to counter those things. And he's aware of what his actions will be if it happens. You know, what, what I like yeah. about your book is it's not rocket science. And I say that with a total, with a total praise. There's nothing there that the average person can't do. You just basically make them aware of what to do, which Never thought be I never thought before. And it's not go out and buy a gun. We live in New York. We're not allowed to own guns. Only criminals own them. So we we, we the, the book is what I liked about it. It was simple. I don't have to remember fifty different things to do. And you look at the end of it, which I think the brilliance of it. It's common sense. But we don't think that way. Common sense, like. In New York City, they have a habit of putting a housing project in the middle of high income homes, right? So where do you think, where do you think another way, you know, when I talk about how people are not realistic, I mean, where do you think all the crime is going to be? It's going to be right there. And where I used to live uh, over on West End Avenue to get from the train at Lincoln Center, you had to walk through the Lincoln Center projects. And by and large, you know, the crime that happened in there, about three murders a year would happen to people that lived in there. But all these people would walk through there from the train to get to these other, you know, higher income buildings. And every once in a while, you would have somebody that was raped or mugged. And it was a surprise to them. I talked to a girl who was a Russian, very famous Russian dancer who got mugged and she was shocked. And I was I, I asked her, I said, you know, you've been all over the world, right? She goes, yeah, I go, what would make you think? that that was a safe way to walk when you could have gone literally a block down and around and you would have been fine. And she said, I, I just was comfortable. I didn't, in New York is, you think it, well, it was New York's changed, but you, you just take for granted that it's safe and you should never take that. You for think granted. for granted say, cause there's so many people around, but when you need these people, they're not there. <laughs> You know, That's, well, attackers don't work like that. Attackers don't sit around and say, I guess I'll attack right now. They don't do that. They <laughs> sit around and they study the environment. And they know that, for instance, somebody walking through, there's probably 10,000 girls that walk through there a day. But they know which ones have what they've identified as expensive purses or things that they're probably going to have in those purses. And, and that's what they target. And they target them at very specific times. Right. Beautiful. Jonathan Gilliam, man, we have to have you back on the show because I could speak to you uh, for hours. It's it's phenomenal, excellent stuff. I love it. The book is Sheep No More. If you don't have a copy, go out and get the copy. Give it to your wife. Give it to your kids. Uh, I know I told you I bought the uh, your book for the kids, for my grandchildren. Once yep. four and a half, and I just was amazed at how engrossed she was uh, in the pictures because the book has no words. And you have lesson plans right here. <laughs> there you go. The adventures of the little bigs, uh, really great stuff. My daughter's printing out the lesson plans, but, uh, you know, look, it could save your life and, uh, it'd save the lives of those around you. And 
the cost is, I don't know, 10, 15 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> and the, other about, the other thing about this book is that um, there's no words in it. And so as it turns out, what's happened is it's gotten great reviews from uh, people who have autistic children or learning disabled children. Um, because, you know, the lessons that are in there, you know, don't lie to your parents, uh, don't play behind a car. Those are, these are pictures. And so they can learn from the pictures. And that's, that was a whole gist of this, you know, was how do I, you know, this book, Sheep No More teaches, like I said, a 10 year old and above, but how do I teach children at the youngest age when they're a sponge, how to be aware? And so that was, that was, a uh, you know, a, it was a step in the direction of, yeah. uh, putting that knowledge in them at the youngest age while reminding the parents um, that, Hey, you should probably check behind your car before you go backwards. Or, uh, you know, I've so many tragedies that I, that on the, in the lesson plans, uh, which are written for adults. Uh, I don't just say, you know, teach your kid not to play behind the car. I, I tell them the story uh, that the tragic, I know somebody tragic, who's had a tragedy. Yeah, tragic, you know? tragedy. It's a thing. Jonathan Gilliam, thanks so much, man. This has been absolutely great. We got to have you back on the show uh, in the future because I, I love them, man. All right, Jonathan, thank yeah. you so much. And, and, and you know, I'm glad you're on our side. I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I'm glad you are too. <laughs> great, man. Thanks so much. You, you got it, brother. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Charles Mizrahi Show. If you're a new listener, welcome. If you've been listening for a while, we're glad to have you back. Either way, we'd love to know what you think of the show. Please leave a review if you listen on Apple Podcasts. Reviews make it easier for others to find the show. You can also see the video of the interview on the Charles Mizrahi Show channel on YouTube.